Hello everyone, I am Matthew Bow, CEO for Cushman & Wakefield across Asia Pacific. Welcome to today's webinar, which we have titled Reclaim 2020 H2 Insights. We have a really interesting session planned for you today, which I'm sure you will find valuable. So over the last few months, the pandemic has had a material and somewhat unprecedented impact on the global economy, which significantly disrupted commercial real estate markets across the world with Q2 being particularly brutal. However, as we have started to trawl through the economic and real estate data for Q2, we believe there are some grounds for cautious optimism within Asia Pacific. So our objective today is to provide you with a view on the second half of 2020, which takes into consideration a confluence of different factors ranging from the latest economic and real estate data the impact of government and central bank fiscal and monetary stimulus packages across the world, geopolitical issues such as the ongoing trade tensions between China and the US, and of course, the future impact of the virus, <clears throat> which is dependent on factors such as a second wave, the likelihood and timing of a vaccine, and the potential inoculation of people across the world. So we have taken all these factors, combined with the views of our experts in each market, to form a hypothesis on commercial real estate markets across Asia Pacific for the second half of this year. As part of this hypothesis, we'll share our views on the Occupy market where space demand softened across the region in Q2, but remained in positive territory. As part of this, we'll provide some forecasts on net absorption, rental and vacancy data. We will also look at the commercial real estate investment market and share our view on likely transaction activity for the second half of this year. Today's presentation should take around 20 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A panel with speakers from our business across Asia Pacific. We have allocated plenty of time for Q&A, so make sure you put your questions for our panel into the little box with a question mark at the top right hand corner of your screen. And with that, I will hand over to Dom. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew. Um, over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, what I'd um, like to do is uh, take you through the uh, Q2 uh, data points um, and then our forecasts uh, for the second half of the year. Um, we'll be uh, uh, predominantly focusing um, on the office sector, but also looking um, at what that means uh, for the investment uh, market as well. Uh, in terms of a structure, um, I'll provide you uh, with some headlines to begin with, and then we'll go through those data points uh, to show you how we got to the headlines um, before leaving you um, with a few strategies for both occupiers um, and investors um, on how they might reclaim uh, 2020 and beyond. So let's look at those headlines first of all. And as Matthew was saying, Q2 was particularly difficult, but it's important to note that there is emerging evidence that the recovery is underway. Uh, yes, there has been a short term hit to the regional growth, but the longer term prospects are very much still intact. In the occupier markets, we have seen space demand soften across the region, but important to note that at the regional level, it is still in uh, positive territory. Notwithstanding this though, we have seen widespread uh, rental decline in uh, Q2, and it's likely that there is more to come in the second half of the year. In the investment markets, it's not surprising that volumes are down uh, year on year, and it's 41% um, at the halfway mark per, uh, for the year. But so far, pricing has remained largely stable. We did see a pickup in activity in, in Q2 from Q1. We think that trend will continue in the second half of the year, but that overall volume for the full year will be will be below what we've seen um, over the past few years. So with those as the headlines, let's get in, into the data. And it's hard to overstate just how difficult Q2 has been. We saw lockdowns all across Asia Pacific, which then moved to other parts of, of the world. And effectively, the globe has been put on a temporary pause. And we can see that um, really stymie GDP growth in uh, 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 Q2. The chart on the left shows uh, Q2 GDP growth in quarter on quarter uh, annualized terms. And you see just how uh, uh, steeply every economy in the region has slowed. And then associated with that, we've seen a spike um, in the unemployment rate, which is the chart on, on the right. 
we have the light blue dot, which is, which is the level for Q1 2020. And then we have the darker triangle, which is the level for Q2 uh, 2020. And we can see again, very, very sharp increases and perhaps none more so than in, in the Philippines, where we saw the increase go from 5.7% to just under 18%. So quite a staggering increase. And indeed, unfortunately, Q2 saw quite a few staggering results and not for right reasons. Uh, in Singapore, we saw retail sales plummet 52% uh, year on year in May. Clothing sales uh, in Australia dropped 53% a month on month in April. In Japan, we saw exports decline nearly 20% year on year in April. And indeed, tourism all across the region has been dramatically um, impacted. And taking just one market, uh, uh, which is Hong Kong, we saw uh, daily visitors in April last year of 186,000 uh, decrease to just 100 in April this year. So big, big changes. But there is some light at the end of the tunnel. And that light is very much in, in the form of uh, China. Just in, in the last week or so, we've had the China Q2. If we can go back a slide, please, sorry. Um, just in, in, the, um, in the last um, uh, week, we've seen uh, Q2 uh, results for China GDP, and they came in at 12.4% quarter on quarter. So very strong uh, rebound um, as, uh, as the Chinese economy uh, reopened. And I think that's the important thing to note around Q2. So a lot of the more negative numbers that I've just presented you with, um, they happened in April um, and uh, uh, May. Whereas if we look to the data um, in June and, and then more recently, we do see it start to see some of those green shoots start to emerge. So if we do look at that China data now, just in a little bit more detail, it starts to give us that picture of the rebound. So these are PMI scores. And anything above 50 is, is uh, considered um, um, an expansion, whereas below 50 is a contraction. And what you see here is, is in the February result, that was when China was locked down at its hardest, and we saw a very steep plummet in, into negative territory. However, when the economy reopened, we saw that sharp rebound. And perhaps more pleasingly is the fact that it stayed above that 50 mark over the past four months. And again, this is associated with global demand, especially out of Europe and, and the US, uh, holding up much better than first um, anticipated. And if you look at other PMIs across the region, they're also heading towards uh, positive territory as well. They haven't quite got there yet, but they are heading in the right direction. And if we look at other data across the region as well, um, the Asia Pacific REIT market improved uh, by 15% on Q2 whereas um, the wider equities market also clawed back some of the major losses that it saw in uh, Q1, uh, such that um, it ended um, the, uh, the second quarter just 10% down from where it was at the start of the year. We've seen sales rebound, and also we've seen workplace mobility scores increase as well as people have started to return uh, to the office. So there are these uh, green shoots that are starting to emerge. And indeed, we think the recovery is probably going to be a three speed uh, recovery. If we can move on, please, to the next slide. Uh, this is some interesting work that has been done uh, by, by Oxford Economics. Uh, on the X axis, going from left to right, is what they term their recovery score or bounce back ability to put it in a, a different way. This is based upon um, how the virus has been contained, the length and stringency of lockdowns, and the size of the policy response to the uh, pandemic. On the vertical axis going up and down is uh, the revision of the 2020 GDP forecast from the end of last year to the H2 point this year. So just to explain this in a little bit more detail, if we take India on the left-hand side, India saw some very stringent lockdowns um, a few months ago. It's also still struggling to keep uh, the virus caseload under control. And it's actually got one of the highest uh, caseloads uh, globally. And indeed, Bangalore has only just come out of its second lockdown in the last few days. With that, we've seen a steep revision to 2020 GDP, 
which at, at the start of the year was forecast to be around positive 6.5%. This has now been downgraded to around about negative 5.7%. At the other end of, of the spectrum, uh, we see Taiwan that was very successful in uh, containing the virus early on, but more importantly, it's kept the virus uh, contained. And so as a result, we see the downgrades uh, to GDP be much more shallow from 2% to negative 0.6%. And at this point, it's also worth calling out China. Um, China, ag again, was forecast to grow about five uh, to five and a half half percent in uh, 2020. At the height of the, of the pandemic, it was actually forecast to nearly touch on a negative growth. But more recently, this has been upgraded to 2% growth in 2020. And indeed, on the back of the Q2 results we've just seen, it's now up to 2.5%. And just by way of comparison, a growth in, in the US was originally due to be around 1.6% uh, in 2020. It's now looking like negative 4% in 2020, which would put it somewhere in, in the middle um, of, of the vertical. Now, if we roll this back up to the regional level, what does it mean for the outlook? So we're still expecting an elongated U. But I think there's something key to the change that we've seen from, from Q1 to now. Whereas we saw a return to pre-COVID levels um, that was originally due to happen in early 2022, this has been brought forward now by three to six months, so late 2021. And more importantly, uh, for, uh, for, uh, from a real estate perspective, we also see this flow through into the jobs market as well. So as a region, we lost in the vicinity of 85 million jobs over the first half of, of the year. Over the next four quarters, we're expecting to slowly uh, recoup those, those losses, um, such to the fact that in uh, Q3 um, next year, if everything remains on, on track, we should start to hit in, in, into net positive jobs growth. So against that backdrop, What's been happening in the office markets? And it's important to start with a positive here, and that's that net absorption stayed in positive territory in the second quarter, um, just under 7 million square foot across the region as a whole. Now, this was down 45% quarter on quarter and is about a third of the average that we've seen over the past few years, which has been around 25 million square feet. But this needs to be put into context in the global sense. We've got some early data from around uh, the world, and we've seen that, it's, that it is a somewhat different picture. In London, there's been a 63% decline quarter on quarter um, in, in the level of net absorption, and a, nearly a 70% decline a uh, year on year in uh, Q2. If we look to the US, there's actually been negative net absorption of nearly 23 million square feet. Um, and also vacancy has increased by 60 basis points. So that does stand in somewhat stark contrast to what we see for Asia Pacific. And, and whilst vacancy did tick up by 30 basis points, this was more on, on the back of new supply. We saw new supply exceed uh, uh, the level of uh, demand and so vacancy did tip upwards. Speaking to our key research leads in the region, their view right now is that they think Q2 uh, from a demand perspective is about as bad as it's uh, going to get. Now that might not mean that Q3 will be materially better, but at the same time, they don't think that it will be demonstrably worse either. So notwithstanding that being a relatively positive result, what we have seen though is, is that there has been some rental softening all across the region. As an average, this has been around about 3% for the region as a whole. Um, whereas in Sydney, um, it has been as much as about 8.5%. If you can bring that chart up, please. Thank you. Um, I would say for Sydney, though, that's very much been handled uh, by incentives. Face rents have been largely fat, whereas we've seen um, um, an increase um, in, in the level of, of incentives offered in, in the quarter. 
And this has been the preferred method for most landlords across the region where they've been able to do it, offer greater incentives, but try to preserve face rents. So that's the situation as it stands right now, and it, and it does lead us on to the multi-million dollar question of what's the outlook for the second half of the year. First of all, taking vacancy. Simply going to have to accept that vacancy is going to be rising over the second half of the year. Now, as I said in our webinar in uh, Q1, the markets across the region came into the pandemic at very different stages um, of the cycle. And so we're likely to see them leave it with slightly different trajectories as well. If we look at Tokyo and uh, Taipei, for example, both were very, very tight markets at the start of the year, relatively limited levels of, of, of supply for the year, and, and that supply had been well pre-committed. So on the back of that, we've only got modest rental increases, I'm sorry, a modest uh, vacancy increases over the second half of the year. Whereas for some Chinese markets, there is a lot of supply still expected in the second half of, of the year. So whilst we expect demand to stay modestly positive, it's, it's that excess level um, of new supply which is driving the vacancy level upwards. What I would point to, though, is that 2021 does look to be a period of uh, stability uh, for these markets. In Sydney, it's a slightly different picture. We are expecting a net negative uh, demand, and so that's what's pushing the vacancy up to near double digit figures uh, over the next year in that particular market. So with that happening in uh, vacancy, we do expect rents then to soften further over the second half of the year. And if we look at the two markets on the left hand side, first of all, this is where we see the, the steepest uh, declines. Uh, clearly, Hong Kong has had a number of headwinds over the past 18 months, first with the US-China trade war, then local in instability and now the pandemic. And we have seen rents uh, come off last year and they're likely to come off further this year under our forecasts. Looking to 2021, though, those losses do become smaller. For Singapore, the situation is slightly different. We've seen very strong rental growth in Singapore over the last three years, but that has now been uh, reversed in uh, 2020 in, in light of a uh, weak sentiment. The situation for 2021, though, is somewhat different and is very much about the level of uh, looming supply. There's, there's 2 million square foot um, of new supply that's expected to come online either late 2021 or in, in 2022. And it's that spectre of the looming supply which is driving the greater rental decline in 2021. Elsewhere across the region, though, it's very much a story of rental decline in, in 2020 with stability and perhaps some modest growth in some markets in 2021. So changing tack now and looking at the investment markets. As I mentioned at the start, it isn't surprising that we've seen volumes decline over the first half of the year to the tune of around 41%. Uh, percent. This has come from a number of different reasons. Uh, clearly, um, travel restrictions have played a very large part, both for cross-border investors, but also for uh, domestic investors in some markets that haven't been able to travel outside of their home cities or their home states. If you factor that in with the un uncertain economic outlook uh, and the uncertain occupier outlook, it then has led to an increase in, in the mismatch in pricing between vendors and purchasers. And so many have chosen to stay on, on the sidelines over the first half of the year. At around $260 billion US invested in the first half of the year, it has put us back to around 2016 levels. So whilst that's, that's the regional picture, it has been different between sectors and also between countries um, within the region as well. Uh, we know that from the restrictions and the lockdowns um, that retail and hotel have been most impacted. And we see this with the sharpest uh, declines um, in, in the investment volumes over the first half of the year. Um, for the most part, vendors haven't wanted to offer, offer assets up, up for sale and then let and then lock in uh, losses. 
The industrial sector, though, has been has been much more resilient, down only 12 percent at the halfway mark. And I think this speaks volumes to the uh, defensive uh, qualities of the sector. Um, long awaited uh, lease expiries are highly sought after in the current environment. And if you factor in the fact that we've also seen growth in some sectors within the industrial market, that's prompting um, investors to look at it very closely. Cold storage, uh, logistics um, and warehousing we've seen grow in some markets and indeed actually seen uh, some rental growth in some markets um, around the region. If we move on to the onto the pricing side of things so far I would say that in the office sector at least pricing has been very stable but that in no small part has been due to the very limited number of assets which have been offered up for sale. Right now we're not really seeing any signs of uh, distress, but it is something that we that, that we are looking at very, very closely. And it's probably likely to show itself if, if it does in other sectors, with those two being retail and hotels, as the impacts um, of lower income start to be felt. On the other side, industrial is probably going to be a much more resilient because of those defensive qualities I just talked about. If you think about the investment market more widely, though, it still remains very attractive. Commercial real estate is still very attractive. We've seen bond yields tighten a little bit further in the past quarter, whilst property yields have, have stayed stable. So spreads have therefore in, increased, and that's helped uh, reinforce the relative value of commercial real estate. So I think over the second half of, of the year, we'll still continue to see high quality assets be very hotly uh, contested. So against that backdrop, I think it's now important to focus on a few key strategies, both for occupiers and investors, on how they might reclaim 2020 and also the growth beyond. Starting with the occupier side, I would say, first of all, carefully think whether to offer space up for sublease. We're seeing markets that are currently flush with options and indeed Sydney is, is back to sublease um, a vacancy that we last saw in the GFC. With this, sublease rents are likely to be well below uh, market level, which if you then factor in the costs of carving off that space for sublease, might not result in the kinds of returns which corporates may have been targeting to begin with. I do get asked a lot around the impact of workplace flexibility on office demand. And for me, this is something that's going to be playing out over the median term. It isn't just a case of mandating working from home. There's actually a lot more moving parts than this. And so, so to corporates, I would strongly advise that they, that, that they seek to align their financial goals with their corporate real estate strategy, but also their HR policies as well. Those policies around health, safety, um, IT equipment, um, expectations, um, and all of those kinds of things. Bring that together under, under a plan for change, uh, for change management, and that way um, you can bring about your workplace uh, transformation. And that's why I think it's, 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 it's going to take longer to play out. On the facilities management side, very much a focus on user experience, those occupying the space. Health and safety has to be top of the list and also wellness. And I think as we look um, into, into the future, things like touchless uh, technology will also become high priorities. On the investor side, safeguarding portfolio occupancy has to be imperative, either through uh, tenant retention or through uh, a new leasing. I think this way will be the best way to, to uh, secure asset values. Until we, we get a clearer read on the outlook, I think we can expect less stock on, on the market. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sit on your hands. There could well be uh, accelerated uh, development opportunities in the industrial space, especially in warehousing and also logistics, where we've seen that rising occupier demand. So it may well be that you can bring forward um, some, some uh, development ideas. And last but not least, actively seek opportunities for sale and lease back. Corporates are likely to reassess their balance sheets and indeed freehold assets may be offered up, up for sale to help with, with uh, uh, dealing uh, with costs. So with that, Matthew, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Dom. 
All right, so before we kick off the, uh, the Q&A, I would like to introduce our four panellists that will be part of the Q&A session. Uh, Sean Jenkinson is the Managing Director for our Asia Pacific Global Occupier Services business. Sean recently moved from London and is now based uh, in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Dom Brown, who you just heard from, is our Asia Pacific Head of Insight and Analysis, uh, and Dom is based in sunny Brisbane. Uh, Jamie Shepard is our Head of Research for Greater China. Jamie is based in Shanghai, but is being stuck in Scotland for the last three months due to the pandemic. It's about 4 a.m. in the morning in Glasgow, so we really appreciate Jamie waking up early to participate uh, on our panel. And Lisa Mahaya is our very talented Head of Workplace for Australia, and Lisa is based in Melbourne. So if you haven't already done so, please submit your questions through the Q&A window. Okay, well, we already have a couple of questions coming through. Dom, uh, this one's directed at you. You spoke about green shoots in the economic data in Q2. How does Asia Pacific as a region uh, compare to the Americas and EMEA? Uh, yeah, sure. Good, good question. I, I think to answer it directly, we compare very favourably. Um, we've seen governments around the region um, give a very swift response in terms of, of, of the lockdowns, but also the uh, policy response. And I think by and large, um, the outcome of both of them have, have been uh, uh, successful. And we start to see that in, in those China Q2 uh, numbers. And indeed, just, just looking at those numbers, I did a quick um, skirt around the major economies across Europe, APAC, and also North America. And by my reckoning, there are only two markets that are forecast to have positive GDP growth in 2020, and, and they are China and uh, Vietnam. So I think on that respect, um, we're doing very well. If we look specifically within Europe, uh, the UK is doing it tough right now, and that and that comes out in their 2020 forecast, which is which is looking like minus 11% at the moment for the UK, uh, minus 8% uh, for the Eurozone. Moving across uh, to the US, it's a bit of a mixed story. Clearly, it's a large country, it's a diverse country. We've seen um, some positive news on the jobs market, on retail sales, on the housing market, but at the same time, we, we do see um, virus flare-ups and also renewed uh, lockdowns. So I think, Overall, APAC is uh, comparing uh, favourably, and I think that comes down to the uh, the ability to reopen earlier, but more importantly, stay open. Terrific, thanks, Dom. Jamie might fire this one to you uh, and to the other side of the world. We saw China beat its Q2 GDP forecast, hitting 3.2%. What drove this, and do you think forecasts will be revised upwards for the rest of the year? Thanks, Matt. Um, so in comparison to, to previous downturns, China now benefits from a strong uh, domestic economy and recent export momentum outperformed expectations, picking up further in June. Um, current forecasts are indicating 5 to 7% GDP growth for the second half of the year. And next year, a spike uh, is forecast of as much as 20% in, in Q1 for the and for the year uh, more modest, but still attractive 5.4%. To add to this, recent revisions to global employment forecasts suggest that Asia uh, will drive 61% of service sector jobs over the next 10 years. This, coupled with uh, growing regional affluence and resulting demand, will undoubtedly de uh, drive the real estate sector across the uh, region. For investors in, uh, I think, Asia, in particular, mainland China is proving particularly attractive given early indications of the rapid rebound uh, that jo uh, Dom has talked about, and of course, uh, strong growth outlook in comparison to other regions globally. Jamie, how much does, you know, the demand for um, you know, Chinese goods um, in, coming out of the US and Europe impact China domestically, and are you seeing a Dom reference before that the PMI um, index uh, performance was better than what first um, predicted for Q2? What's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, Matt, I think that the, uh, of course, uh, China still uh, does uh, rely on exports uh, to uh, a fairly high degree. I would say that over this period of time, many uh, 
would be buyers of product have found it quite difficult to sort of uh, reorganize supply chains closer to home because of course that was one of the major challenges china's done very well uh, at getting people back to work back into factories um so in terms of fulfillment uh china is very strong and i think it's very difficult uh, for many buyers at the current time to redivert to choose other suppliers globally uh, and demand is still reasonable uh, for Chinese products. And is there being demand out of China for, you know, um, PPE and other equipment? Is, is that helping to um, firm up those 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 numbers for China for Q2? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely been a, a boom in production of PPE. But I don't think that that's necessarily really driving. I think this is uh, strong uh, underlying demand uh, for products. Um, and as I said, fulfillment is is key. Uh, so people have not uh, diverted away from the China market for supplying goods. Right. Thanks, Jamie. All right, Lisa, this one for you. Um, how do you see the office uh, evolving in the future? What is the role of office? Thanks, Matt. The results from our experience per square foot working from home survey indicated that 73% of respondents would like to work flexibly going forward. However, interestingly, half of that number said that they missed the human connection and social bonding with colleagues and peers that happen in the office environment. Organisations we've spoken to throughout this period continue to believe in the importance of the office for valuable social interaction and as well as places for collaboration and face-to-face -face ideation. Although there's no one size fits all, as we look to the future, um, the purpose of the traditional office may evolve to become a destination for employees to strengthen cultural connections, provide spaces for enhanced learning, um, and they'll be there to foster creativity and innovation for organisations in the future. Thanks, Lisa. We we have a question here um, specifically on Singapore and maybe Dom, you can take this or someone else can jump in. Um, you know, the rent forecast that really stands out for Singapore is a dramatic decline in 2020. Can you provide some colour around this? Yeah, um, sure. And it, it was something that that actually caught my eye when we were preparing the data and, and preparing um, uh, the webinar. Um, in that it was a stock uh, decline, and so and so having a chat with with our head of research in in the market, um, I, I did get a, a greater lens on on what was going on on the ground. And I think in the first instance, it's important to recognise that that rents have increased by an excess of fifteen percent over the last couple of years. Uh, two, two to three years. So some of the decline um, in, in light of uh, weakened sentiment in 2020 is actually just the clawing back from a tenant perspective, uh, some of that growth that's occurred over previous years. Um, that steeper decline in uh, 2021 is very much tied to the level of uh, new supply which is in the pipeline. As you said, we've we, we've got two million square foot um, of space which is due to be completed in uh, 2020, and peak demand of late has been around a million square foot. So whilst we're not seeing vacancy tick up here either this year or or next year that much, it will increase further in uh, 2021. And so that 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 steeper decline in the rents in in 20 in uh, 2021 um, is is as a result of of that looming vacancy uh, that's um, that we think is going to be coming in into the market in the next couple of years. Right. Thanks, Dom. Um, Sean, this one's for you. What are corporates doing in the short term to lower their real estate operating costs? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a yeah huge a huge challenge for them out there. I mean, I think um, I think in the first instance, you know, everybody looked immediately at you know what their leases stated. Was there the opportunity to have you know sort of renegotiations with landlords? The the, the sort of obvious things. I think quickly followed by people doing a, a detailed review of their immediate lease hour events, um, you know, really understanding active projects. Do they really need all the space they have? Do they have some some easy wins in terms of, of exits? I think in terms of surplus space, people are looking very hard at what that looks like in their portfolios, what they think that might look like, uh, you know, as things rebound and, you know, looking at opportunities to, to put space in reserve, you know, taking payments, et cetera. I think from an FM perspective, 
you know, it's, a, it's a, it, with a number of sites, um, you know, being being underused or not used at all during periods of time. I mean, clearly occupiers have looked to try and reduce their spend in some of the services. But, you know, I think as, as Don said, the reality is things are returning is in the actual operating expenditure. Um, you know, our occupier clients are looking very much at that employee experience and potentially additional costs in in readying the office back for people's return, you know, versus a focus on tactical delivery. So yeah, looking at the looking at the least hour events as a as the as the immediate focus. Yeah, it's interesting. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Dom, uh, do you see APAC real estate markets recovering first in a global context, which I think you you sort of answered before, and which markets will lead the way in our region and recover first? Yeah, um, that's that's an interesting question um, in terms of, of the recovery. And as I said, different markets came in in different stages of, of the cycle. So there's the recovery, I suppose we can break this question down into maybe two parts, the recovery from the pandemic and then what the outlook looks like from there. And I think again, if we it comes back to to those economies that have, have been at best at dealing with the virus, um, have reopened earliest and 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 have stayed open, which are those are the ones which we're likely to uh, to see the recovery in in the real estate markets first of all. And so, in a, Taiwan um, is 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 one that definitely stands out there. I think uh, Japan uh, could uh, recover um, quite quickly as well. And indeed, China has shown its resilience. Um, tier one markets in uh, China uh, returned to positive uh, net absorption in in Q2 this year. So I think that that points to their underlying strength. Now we then move on to some of the market factors, and as I was saying, we we do see high levels of uh, supply in some markets in 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 China, which will see vacancy rise, but also uh, suppress rents a little bit. But I suppose that's almost can be seen as a positive as it's as it's the market getting back into the natural cycle rather than um, the COVID-19 imposed cycle. So I think they're the they're the kind of markets I'd probably look to first of all at the moment. Right, great. Thanks, Dom. All right, Lisa, uh, how are companies rethinking their office space strategy across Asia Pacific? It's a pretty broad question. Yeah, it's, so I'll have a crack at it, Matt. Uh, despite, you know, from the way we're looking at, despite organisations witnessing how it is possible for teams to work in other ways, feedback from surveys and some of the roundtable discussions we've had with clients um, identify that it won't negate people yearning for that social connectivity and the need for office space in some form. Um, some of the early indicators suggest that organisations are looking forward with a combination of uh, flexible working strategies that encompass both the virtual and the physical, as, as we all have experienced, alongside variable office space solutions in both uh, an urban and a suburban location. Also, uh, an increase in agility and employees deciding how, when and where they work will enable organisations to look at space optimisation. Um, and we may also see strategies that include disaggregated HQ offices um, in suburban hubs located closer to home. So, you know, again, not one size fits all, but lots of exciting opportunities opening up as, as we look to going back in the future. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out over the, certainly the remainder of this year and the next couple of years. Um, Sean, with, do you see the, an acceleration of technology in the way of facilities Sorry, in the way facilities are managed as a result of COVID-19, and what are some of the key trends? Yeah, um, I think the answer is yes, we, we absolutely do. Um, with regards to te technology COVID related, I think in the first instance, um, you know, occupiers are very focused on, um, you know, their, their people returning to the office. So around touch technology, whether that's, you know, access systems, face recognition, thermal imaging, you know, changing with inside the space to sliding doors or automated doors rather than people having to use push pull handles, etc. You know, coffee machines, photocopiers, all the things which people are going to be interacting physically. So definitely a focus in that area. I think there's clearly been a, a leveraging of existing technology that might have been underutilized. So whether that's you know, Skype or Teams or Zoom, that's clearly something now which has accelerated and some organisations have had to, to really bring that in for the first time. Um, 
And then I guess as we look to to go forward, I think I think you know our Occupy clients are very focused on harnessing the data that they're going to need to really understand what this new norm looks like. So you know, meeting room booking systems, desk allocation, particularly with social distancing, you know, contact tracing, all those things that need to be to be considered. I think there's a bit of a pause at the moment whilst um, you know our corporates are, are really understanding that data and being mindful they need more of it to really really inform what that future looks like. Yeah, thanks, Sean. There's certainly a bit to digest there for for occupiers. The um, Jamie, interesting questions come through, uh, which I think is probably best directed to you. Are you seeing any change in investor confidence at the end of quarter two? And and what markets or asset classes are attracting interest from investors across Asia Pacific? Thanks, Matt. Um, well, obviously, investors have had their hands pretty full uh, over the last sort of uh, few months, but sentiment is really improving very rapidly. Uh, and I'd say that appetite for investment in key Asia Pacific markets appears to be returning um, in fairly short order. Um, uh, however, I would would add that in, intending buyers are expecting healthy discounts to the 2019 pricing, uh, whereas, as Dom mentioned, given limited evidence of, of uh, sales and for sales, uh, vendors are typically holding relatively firm on their pricing expectations. And of course, that has an impact in terms of the length of the negotiations. Um, there's been uh, a notable increase in inquiries relating to the logistics sector across the region. Uh, in China, business parks in Shanghai and Beijing and in Tokyo, uh, multifamily interest. And we've seen really encouraging responses to some of the post COVID mandates that our team in uh, Singapore has brought to the market. In India, uh, office and business park assets, well, before uh, this uh, pandemic, these assets were performing really well, strong leasing. Uh, and I think that's remaining front and center, given potential for strong leasing demand to return in the future. Um, we note uh, increasing appetite for alternative asset categories, strong demand, as I mentioned, for logistics uh, and fairly limited interest, I'd say, in retail or hotel assets, unsurprisingly, but except in situations where there's a repositioning uh, opportunity uh, or the possibility of some major adjustment in pricing. Um, likewise, appetite for speculative development and development risk at the current time is quite muted. Uh, for office investment, we're seeing mixed sentiment, though typically there's now a stronger preference for stabilized assets, core stabilized assets, as investors treat lease up risk and development activities with much more caution. It's interesting, Jamie, and just it's certainly in the back end of this year and maybe the first half of next year, do you see um, Asia having a preference for international capital, particularly out of Europe and, and the Americas or out of the, uh, Europe and probably the US? Um, well, absolutely. I think that if you look at uh, many surveys uh, in recent years, we've seen definitely seen a rise of interest in APAC. Um, now, obviously, um, we're seeing uh, very strong, in fact, if you look at this, the uh, employment forecasts, many of these have been updated recently. Um, if you look at those forecasts, we're going to see strong tertiary employment over the next 10 years in Asia Pacific. Um, the region obviously has uh, rebounded uh, fairly quickly in comparison to other regions uh, globally. So absolutely, I think for investors that are based uh, outside Asia, they're going to think to themselves, well, looking at our portfolio currently, are we overweight in our home markets? So there's been a bit of an argument that many investors will retrench back to home markets, but I think Asia really still stands out as a uh, attractive investment destination at the current time. Terrific. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Dom, um, Something has come up a few times. What is your view of a trend towards decentralization of office markets in Asia Pacific? Yeah, decentralization seems to be one of the um, the topics of, of the day at the moment. I'm hearing it um, from multiple different sources in, in multiple different regions. Um, most of it associated with the hub and spoke models. Uh, whereby occupiers um, have a CBD uh, presence, which is the hub, and then um, one or more um, locations in fringe or peripheral 
uh, markets being the uh, spokes. Um, I think for Asia Pacific, it is it is slightly um, it is slightly different. Um, decentralization is actually a trend that's been going on for a few years now, especially in India markets and in uh, China markets. But increasingly, we're seeing it um, mentioned in, and discussed in Singapore, um, Hong Kong, um, even in um, um, Sydney and uh, Melbourne, where CBD vacancy has been very, very tight until recently. Um, there's been talk about you know, moving back offices to uh, fringe or suburban markets. So it's something that's that's been around for a while. Um, occupiers are very interested in it um, from a cost perspective. Uh, developers are interested in it because of um, uh, the ability uh, to uh, secure sites. And I think if you then put the COVID lens on it, of the difficulty of getting people into and out of the CBD and, and high density areas, it is likely to, to be a trend that we'll see um, continue to accelerate um, in the years to come. And I think where occupiers go, um, investors um, will follow. And um, I might just quickly pass to Jamie on this, because I, I think if I remembered this uh, correctly in, in your recent webinar on, on um, I think capital markets in China, which you held last week, there was um, there was quite an interesting stat. That I think decentralized investment exceeded CBD investment. Um, I might pass to you just to speak to it on on kind of the investment side of things. Thanks, Dom. Um, so yes, it's it's quite interesting. In fact, if you look at Shanghai as an example, you've got this uh, decentralized area which sits in between the business parks and the core CBD areas. Um, and the vacancy there is actually very high in comparison to those other two areas. And you might think that perhaps uh, that would uh, cause some great challenges from an investment perspective. But in fact, what we've noticed is uh, that in China, there's been uh, perhaps the, the, the reverse of what we've seen elsewhere in terms of sale and leaseback. We've seen a lot of owner occupiers move in to acquire assets in the market. Now, if you're an owner occupier, you're not so sensitive uh, to that vacancy because obviously you're not looking to, to lease out in, in what might be a challenging market. So actually it's this, there's been this stabilizing effect in the investment market overall, where traditional investors have been largely, largely making inquiries on the core and the business park areas. And then we've had this wave of, of interest uh, from owner occupiers looking to take advantage of what they see as a good time to negotiate and, and get some decent pricing on and assets in decentralized areas which have uh, fa uh, fantastic infrastructure uh, and perhaps they have a sort of mid to long term view as well. Terrific, thanks, thanks, Dom, thanks, Jamie. Um, Lisa, this one's I think most suited to you. What role will flexible space play in the future real estate strategy of corporates? Yeah, and I think it's a good follow on from uh, what Dom was just talking about and Sean, you know, we've heard from clients and employees that there is a reduced desire to use public transport and be among large groups of people um, when, when we're thinking about the return to office. Um, in response to this feedback, many of the corporates that we've spoken to are, are exploring more agile work styles for employees that incorporate things like rostered and staggered start and finish times. Um, and this will naturally result in the de-densification of office space and provide opportunities for the physical office to offer more adaptable work settings that align with those rosters and those different start and finish times. So lots of reusable um, and shared environments uh, that can easily be configured depending on the organisational need uh, for that moment, whether it be training or a town hall or more collaboration, um, but certainly a, a different view around flexibility. Thanks, Lisa. Sean, how confident can corporates be right now in setting a long-term workplace and portfolio strategy with, with so much um, uncertainty? Yeah, I think I think it's it's difficult to be confident. I mean, I, I, I gather the word you know, setting. Obviously, a lot of our, our, our clients will already have, um, you know, a, a long-term strategy that's in play. And in many instances, they are, you know, pausing for for thought. Similarly, people setting new strategies, as you, as you said, so much uncertainty remains. You know, I mean, the three key things that we're sort of hearing play back, you know, how does COVID continue to play out? You know, it hasn't gone away yet and there may well be a resurgence in certain countries, certain markets. You know, that, that new normal or exactly uh, how clients are, are looking to occupy their space on a go forward basis. They're not sure yet. They've not had enough staff 
back to the office. They've not had enough data to, to chew through. And then finally, there's the business outlook. You know, depending on sector, depending on the company, exactly what are they seeing as being, you know, the size of their organization, the scale, you know, for the next two, three years. So I think very, very difficult to set that strategy at the moment. But as people are going through, you know, the coming weeks and months, I think they'll be looking very hard at ensuring that there's an element of flexibility in whatever they're deciding to do on the basis that there is still so much uncertainty and change yet to come, which, you know, we can't define. Great, thanks, Sean. Um, Jamie, I might throw this one to you. I think you might have answered the first part, but not so much the second. What do you see the impact on asset values being as a result of COVID-19? And do you see any distressed asset sales in the second half of the year? Jamie, are you there? Yes, Matt, thanks. Um, so I would echo what uh, Dom mentioned earlier. Um, uh, it'll take some time for true distress on any significant scale to emerge where lenders move to repossess assets. However, sales of assets in the current environment where pricing is generally viewed as being temporarily softer might indicate an element of distress. Exceptions to this might be where investors are seeking to recycle capital to take advantage of the emergence of advantageous pricing elsewhere in the region or book a profit to offset losses in other areas of their portfolio. Um, I would say that banks have generally responded fairly quickly um, uh, over the last few months to reduce uh, their exposure to high risk markets, asset categories or those companies with less attractive borrower profiles. Um, refinancing of assets has, has become challenging for some investors that already are highly leveraged or have heavy exposure to maybe the hotel or, or retail sectors. This is going to create some element of, of dis distress, I think. Um, however, in many cases, it's obviously both in the banks and the borrower's interest to avoid a situation where loans are called in. Um, so the, for those borrowers with strong track record, lower gearing and lower levels of exposure to maybe the hospitality and retail sectors, uh, loan terms are likely to be renegotiated to provide a certain degree of leniency during this challenging period. For the second half of the year, hotel and retail assets will probably likely see the largest adjustment to those valuations. Uh, Office assets, perhaps in non-core areas that are carrying significant lease up risk may also be negatively impacted. However, I'd say for the, as I mentioned before, the stabilized assets uh, in core locations, industrial logistics properties uh, will generally see more resilience on their valuations over the remainder of the year. Right, that was a good answer. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so just conscious of time, we've probably got a enough for maybe two or three more questions. Um, Dom, I'll direct this one to you. You talked about the three speed economic recovery across Asia Pacific. Do you see real estate markets in those countries operating at the same speed? Um, yeah, I think I think there are a couple um, of elements to this. I think um, at the at its most fundamental level, the real estate markets do need to see a recovery in GDP uh, growth and also jobs growth um, be um, incredibly difficult um, for real estate markets to recover um, without either of those uh, factors. So I think whatever speed um, that um, that the various economies recover, we'll see that start to translate in, into the real estate market. Um, whether it ends up being three speed, uh, two speed, um, or even more than that, I think it still comes back to the ability to contain the virus, keep it under control, and keep the, uh, uh, the economy open um, at the same time. So there is still quite a lot, quite a lot of fluidity in, in, in the groups. At the moment, it, it has coalesced around that, that three speed um, uh, phase within within the region. Um, but I would just say that whilst some markets may be lagging within the region, they might uh, may find themselves in step or even uh, slightly ahead countries um, in other regions of of the world. So I think it's 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 all relative um, at the moment. Asia Pacific does seem seem to be leading uh, uh, the charge, um, but there is some uh, fluidity in that speed of of recovery and it very much is 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 on the back of the virus containment. 
Thanks, Dom. Uh, so we might just time for two, I think, two more questions. So Lisa, how are companies curating an employee experience and driving connection to culture and brand as most of their staff are working from home? It's a good question. It is a good one, the million dollar question. Um, and, and not easy to answer, but, but what we've seen uh, playing out is, is clearly the expectation has certainly been on people leaders to a large degree. Um, and, it, and we're asking both leaders and employees to commit to learning new skills um, and evolving both personally and professionally uh, to function um, and to excel in this new environment. Um, in this, this new era of the way we're working, allowing people, I think, more choice, um, looking after their health and safety um, and their well-being and helping people to, I guess, operate effectively together across all kinds of boundaries is really, really important. Um, you know, organisations who are embracing and supporting that, that flexibility um, for employees and curating that change seem to be having the greatest success um, when it comes to um, an enhanced employee experience. Because um, as we all know, at the end of the day, business performance is supported through the power of the people. So, you know, again, um, a, a lot of work playing out, but certainly an emphasis on, um, on our senior leaders uh, leading the way in this space. Great, thank you, Lisa. And our last question, which is very specific to Korea, so it probably be maybe Dom and and Jamie. But what's your view on Korea? It seems Korea has been holding up well, and some transactions taking place. So I might I might throw to you, Dom. Maybe you can talk about economically um, and, and the lockdown in in Korea, which we know is probably being less so than other markets. And then Jamie, you can maybe talk it from an investment perspective. Uh, yeah, sure, Matt. Um, yeah, I'd agree um, with um, with the uh, person who posed the question. I, I, I do think that South Korea has held up uh, very well. It is in that leading pack in the three phase uh, recovery. Um, jumped on the pandemic um, very early. Um, high level of the uh, testing and 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 has able uh, to stay on top of it over the uh, last few months. And on the back of that, we have seen um, subsequent upgrades to the 2020 outlook over the um, uh, over the past few months. So um, an expectation of roughly negative 2.3% growth this year, but then a strong rebound of nearly 3% growth um, in uh, 2021. Um, and a similar kind of situation in, in, in the jobs market. Yes, there has been a bit of a spike in, in the uh, level um, of unemployment, but that jobs growth is looking to be uh, reversed pretty quickly over the next um, year to 18 months. And so in that respect, again, it's one of the uh, countries within, within the region that, that, that does seem to be leading at the moment. Jamie, did you want to offer a lens from an investment perspective? Sure. So thanks, uh, Dom and Matt. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're an investor and you're in Asia Pacific now, you've you've dipped your toe in the water. You've uh, you've come from from maybe North America or Europe, and you're you're experienced uh, picking up experience in the region. I think Korea is definitely uh, increasingly uh, an attractive destination in terms of diversifying your Asia Pacific portfolio. Um, when we look at the transactions, yes, um, uh, the person that answered uh, asked the question is absolutely right. We did see ongoing strength of uh, activity, uh, investment activity through the first uh, part of the year. And, and as Dom mentioned, that was due, I think, to sort of the rapid clampdown, getting that under control. I think many investors that were perhaps already looking at deals continued through that period and closed off on those transactions. And we're still seeing uh, a large number of inquiries for information uh, on that market. So I would suggest that that market will continue uh, to see strong demand through the remainder or a strong interest the remainder of the year, but perhaps deals will take a little bit longer to close, uh, possibly in the early part of, of uh, next year. Actually, this is quite timely. We've got a, an Asia Pacific Capital Markets webinar coming up soon. And in fact, because of that increased uh, or rather comparatively high transaction volume, uh, we're going to do a spotlight session on Seoul. So look out for that webinar. 
Yeah, terrific. And look, we'll have to bring it to a close there. Thank you uh, for all the wonderful questions. Apologies that we couldn't get through all of them. We did our best uh, to get through as many as possible. Thanks to Dom uh, and our panel. <clears throat> a recording of the webinar and slides will be made available on our website. Uh, all attendees on today's website will receive an email with a link. Uh, more detailed expert views from our leaders across the region will also be available on our website with short videos outlining their view on the second half of this year. So some key takeaways uh, from today's webinar. If you're an investor, uh, safeguard your portfolio occupancy. New leasing and tenant retention are imperative. Uh, there may be uh, opportunities for accelerate. It might be um, accelerated development opportunities in logistics and warehousing with rising occupier demand and proactively seek sale and lease back opportunities. If you're an in, if you're an occupier, uh, carefully consider whether to use sublease space. Markets are likely to be flush with options uh, resulting in low returns. Uh, develop forward looking flexible work uh, work uh, working policies ready for future lease expiries. Be proactive in thinking about the user experience in your office. Embrace technology and focus on local market dynamics to identify opportunities. Uh, in our report, we point out a few, a few things to watch for in the second half of the year, which include favourable sectors, telecommunications, media and technology, healthcare, BPO, uh, e-commerce, uh, preferred asset classes, logistics, warehousing, cold storage uh, and data centres. You know, look to secure assets with long whales, consider a shift in real estate portfolio strategy, start preparing for how you will reimagine the workplace and focus on capital preservation. So with that, I would like to bring our webinar to a close. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, please stay safe, healthy and be well. Thank you.